I guess I'll have to do what Paul did on Mars Hill, just shout loud enough to be heard. <laughs> uh, stand with me one more time, if you would, please. I want us to pray together. Uh, we have something important to pray about. We always do, but on the 10th through the 17th of June, the uh, planning committee for Harrow Council, uh, I think receiving the legal initiative from the current uh, owners of what we believe God has given us, are making an appeal uh, from the Harrow Council's decision to turn down their application to build flats on that land. They're appealing it again, this time to the planning inspectorate. So uh, it didn't pass the planning committee and then it uh, went to the council and didn't pass the council. And so now they're appealing to the planning inspectorate, which is another level of authority above the council. So they have the power to reverse that if they choose to do so in human terms. So I'd like for you to join uh, the person next to you by the hand, and we're just gonna agree together that this uh, operation will fall flat, absolutely fall flat, and we'll be able to move out of this place that we've appreciated, but into a better. Is everybody in agreement with that? Amen. Father, we thank you that in the power of agreement, this application fails. We thank you, Lord, that access is given, provision is given, miracles are given, Lord, to cause us to possess our possessions, to take possession, Lord, of our own sheep shed, to make it, Lord, that instrument in that community and beyond that you intend. Thank you, Lord, for answering this prayer in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Hug three people and you can be seated. I don't think there's any disease on this side of the building. So if you're in the last four rows, could you move forward a couple of rows? I know you're well settled in the seat you always like. But if you're in the last four rows, would you move forward, please? Thank you. It's good to see all of you moving forward. Good. Thank you. And I know some of you are probably wondering, well, why on earth is he taking me out of my comfort zone, out of the seat that I want to sit in? One, because I just plain like to ear it. No. Uh, there's a natural tendency for people to move away from each other. And we live in a world, despite all the social media, where people are more distant than ever. If there's anything that we constantly have to cultivate, it's being together. You can always think of nine reasons why you shouldn't invite somebody to your house or sit close to somebody or talk to somebody on the bus or, you know, just, you know how it is when you get in a lift and there's people in there. What do you do? You kind of move to the wall, don't you? Or toward the back or, and you know, that shouldn't be here. That shouldn't be here. Anyway, enough of that. Anyway, we're talking about worshiping by the spirit. John four and verse 24 says that there is a river that makes glad the city of God. Now I'm on this uh, series because I think that God wants to do something so awesome, so powerful in our worship life. 
because it's the presence of God. Uh, the less of the presence of God you have, the more you live with just your own wisdom, your own knowledge, your own energy. And we need more of God than ever. And so uh, we've been talking about this uh, pattern that God's given us of the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle of David. And I was uh, reminded this week of a second-year university student named Beth. Uh, she had gone to university not believing that there was a God, and, and she had just decided that university was going to be another playground for her, and she would just party and do whatever she was going to do because it was just kind of her against the world, as she said. And, and so that she was in her second year of university, and uh, another young woman kind of down the hall from the living quarters that they were in decided to invite her to a church service. She came into the church service similar to ours, and she didn't really know why she was there except for the fact that this girl that she didn't even know very well had invited her. And she came in, and everybody's singing, and so she thought, okay, I'm going to sing as well. And she started singing. And something strange happened to her. While she was singing, she found herself weeping. Now, this is a young woman who doesn't believe in God. But she's standing there while everybody's singing, and tears are streaming down her face. And she's thinking to herself, what, what is this? What is, what's going on with me? And then it came to her. This was a God she didn't believe in loving her. And as she opened her heart to him, she felt her whole being enveloped with the love of Christ. And on that day, she came to know Christ as her Savior. Nobody had kind of witnessed to her, but she had got into the presence of the all-powerful one who said, you know, I know deep down inside you'd like to know me, so I'm going to reveal myself to you. The power of God's presence is so amazing, so awesome. I was reading another series of testimonies about some people who decided to take a fair number of special needs children into some services and just observe what happened to them. And testimony after testimony after testimony of the remarkable changes that happen in these special needs children simply because they were in the presence of Almighty God. And so one of the great dangers that we have in our time is that we can go through the motions with revelation and insight and just kind of, think, you know, without realizing that God Almighty comes with all that he is and all of his power to be who he is in our midst. And we want to access and take advantage of the greatness of God, the power of God, the goodness of God for everything that, that we require to live and everything that we require to be healthy and everything that we require to do well with our families and our people that we love around the world. We want to be bread for the hungry and water for the thirsty. And that comes out of his presence. And so... The corporate worship service, kind of based at least in part on the Tabernacle of Moses, as we saw last week, the Tabernacle of Moses was a copy and shadow of the Tabernacle in heaven. And so God says, I would just like you to know, I, I have all this worked out on earth because I'm going to cause it to come to its climax in heaven. And so he went through all that effort and described all that detail because this is a copy and shadow of what I'm going to do on Calvary's cross for everybody. And he did it. And I don't think he was just kind of doing something symbolic. 
I don't think everything God does is powerful. It's huge. And it will take eternity to scratch a small percentage of how great and how powerful, how awesome he is. And so doing what we do here on a weekly basis is so important. Last week, we looked a little bit at the progression of travel. You can have that slide, progression of travel from shallow to deep. And just take a few scriptures here, the one we just quoted to you, Psalm 46, 4. There's a river that makes glad the city of God. God said, this thing called the city of God, is where, city is where people are. And if it's God's city, it's where God's people live. And he says, there's a river in that city and it makes them glad. And it's the place where God says that's where he lives. Lots of other verses of scripture throughout the Old Testament and the New that tell us that God lives in a city and the city is people. Uh, I use another analogy in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 6. The Bible says, we are God's house. We are God's house. Uh, this isn't God's house. This is just a sheep shed, temporary as it is. But we are God's house. And God says, this is where I live. So think for a moment. If Jesus in his physical body turned up at your front door, one, would you let him in? Of course, Pastor, don't be silly. I'd let him in. But you, somebody might think, yeah, but I don't know, my house isn't quite clean. <laughs> the windows haven't been washed. I, don't, I haven't done the shopping. <laughs> oh, no, if you recognized it as Jesus, Jesus as Jesus, and he said, you saw him at the front door, you'd open the door and you'd say, wow, come in. Come in. What would you ask him? What would you expect of him? What would he not do? And that's exactly where we are today. He comes here every day, every Sunday. Every Sunday he comes in. He comes in. He's here. He's here right now. The Bible tells us some great truths about this sense of God's presence. I think that's one of the most wonderful things that defines the corporate worship service. It's the presence of God. If you have a corporate worship service and no presence, it was just some singing. But with the presence, it makes all the difference in the world. However, especially for Pentecostals, we can be wonderfully grateful for the presence of God, and I am. I believe you are. But it's still, in many respects, a sensation. It's a perception, a consciousness, if you will. And so God says, I, I want to teach you about myself. Because I'm going to come and live among you by my spirit. And so I want to teach you about the increased consciousness of my presence. You ever been in a room and in your line of sight, you didn't see anybody, but you felt there was somebody there. Anybody have that ever happened to you, you kind of, you just had a sense that there's some, somebody else here. Maybe there's some shadows in the room. If it was dark, you might have thought, yeah, I think it's time for me to get out of here. <laughs> but you, you had this perception that somebody was in the room. And you've also, no doubt, been in a circumstance where somebody appeared behind you. You couldn't see them, but you, you sensed there was another being behind you. Maybe the warmth of their being, maybe you heard their breath, or but you just had this, this sense there's, there's some, and sure enough, it came back. And I know probably you were never like I was. I used to like to kind of sneak up behind people uh, when they weren't so obviously aware and stand right behind them. Stand up, stand up. 
look at these good people. And so you get. <laughs> Can you tell yes, I'm here? <laughs> it's it's uh, bothersome, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can be seated, thank you. So she has a greater sense of my presence when I'm there. And God wants to teach us about this. He says, I want to come and get really close to you. I'm inside of you. But in the way you worship, I want to get so close to you that you are so aware of me that you're not aware of anything else but myself. Myself. And if you study church history, that's called revival. When people got so lost, a group of children started praying. And as they prayed and fasted, God's presence so came among them. They forgot they were children. They started having dreams and visions and prophesying and all kinds of miracles took place because God's presence came in such a powerful way. And I believe that what Clive read this morning was not just something that he found accidentally. It was a message from the Lord. God wants to cause the reign of his presence to come in such a powerful way. And so as we look here at this slide on the progression of travel, the first one I've kind of defined as I'm coming. Psalm 46, 4 says there's a river. And so the river starts when you come in and you make that decision, I'm going to worship the Lord. I'm going to have a, a meeting with God's house and God's people. And I'm going, to, I'm going to come to him and just focus totally on him. In the songs that we sing, in the prayers that we pray, I, I believe, God, you're here in a special, unique uh, way because this is the corporate gathering. This is where you said you live. You live inside of me, but you live in a larger sense in this, in amongst us all. And so you make that decision. Ezekiel chapter 47 speaks of this kind of progression. It's a, there's a river that makes glad the city. It's the place where God dwells. God says, I want to teach you something about my presence. It's a river in a city. So, you know, is God saying, okay, where I dwell, there's a river. Is, it, is there a river in here? There's no literal river in here, but there is a river. And as you study the, the river theme through the scripture, you see this is the river of God's presence. As we said to you last week, God says, I put a river inside of you. He that believes what the scripture has said, out of his innermost being shall flow springs of living water, rivers of living water. By this he meant the Spirit. So it is a spirit river. And so here Ezekiel has this vision of the temple in heaven. In Ezekiel 47, and verse 1 says, The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple, and I saw water coming out from the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side, he brought me out through the north gate, led me around the outside to the outer gate. And as the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, remember I told you a couple of weeks back, God measures our worship. He comes to our worship and he measures it according to the Bible. He measures. God's a measurer. You'll find it throughout the Bible. He measures things. So this man goes and he starts with a measuring line. He measures off a thousand cubits and he led me through the water. This is the water that's flowing out from the threshold of the temple, this river. And the water was ankle deep. Then he measured off another thousand cubits. So there's this progression here through water that was knee deep. Everybody say knee deep. He measured off another thousand, led me through the water that was up to the waist. Everybody say, waist deep. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river I could not cross. 
Everybody say, a river I could not cross. That's where we're headed. A river that we cannot cross. In other words, the water is so deep. The water had risen, the scripture says, and was deep enough to swim in a river that no one could cross. In other words, the depths of God are so released in this river. You can't get across it. All you can do is swim in it. Swim in it. Swim in God's presence. You say, Pastor, do you have any sense of what this is like? I, I believe so. I have, I have a, a small taste in terms of my experience. When the outpouring of the Spirit came in the mid-90s, and God's presence came even amongst this house, and I had never, ever known any kind of encounter with the Holy Spirit quite like it. We would begin the worship service, and the presence of God came so close. It wasn't just that you sensed the presence of God. It was so close, and it permeated people's physical being to the extent that they all of a sudden fell on the floor. And many of them could not get up because they were having this counter encounter with the presence of God. And while they're on the floor, they, in this state of being in this river of God's presence, all kinds of things took place. And some of you who perhaps were here with us during that time knew that sometimes... I'm, I'm, I, on those days, I sat on the platform and I'd fall over on the floor. Nobody ever knew if I was going to preach. I didn't know if I was going to preach. Not because I didn't want to, not because I didn't have a message prepared. But God was just saying to us, just like he did when Solomon's temple was dedicated, they had this amazing worship service. And the Bible says the power of God's presence was so strong none of the priests could do their ministry because God said, it's my turn. It's my turn. In fact, one time when I, I got up and, and I, I could hardly move for this sensation of the presence of God, I kind of staggered to the pulpit and I thought, okay, maybe I should do something after all. I'm the pastor. I, I, sh I, should, I should act like one. <laughs> Sometime. And so I, I started to read a verse of scripture. Noel, it took me 34 minutes to read one verse. Finally, I said, I think I'm going to close. I, and, you know, if I have, I have some regrets in my life, but if I have a regret, if I have a significant regret in my life, is that I did not capture the full significance of what God was doing with his presence among his people at that time. I was impacted. I saw a lot of amazing things. I saw people delivered from terrible, terrible addictions. All kinds of amazing things that came just out of the presence of God. And so, yes, Yes, there is a photograph in my spirit of where I believe God wants to take us and beyond. And so this, that's the nature of this river, this river. Well, there's an alternate river as well. Revelation 12, verse 13. Let's, let's go back to verse 13. Uh, the, uh, the notes say verse 15, but let's go to Revelation 12 and verse 13. Because I want you to get a, a picture of this because 
This is the protagonist to the presence of God. Revelation 12 and verse 13 says, When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, who's the dragon? Okay, the devil, Satan, serpent, dragon. When the dragon saw he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. Now, I'm not going to take time to totally unpack this, but I believe the woman is God's people, the church, the bride. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for time, times, and half a time out of the serpent's reach. That's a good note. But then notice verse 15. Remember we read Ezekiel 47, there was water that flowed out from the throne into the earth and it was an ever-deepening river that developed. Here's another river in the book of Revelation. It says, then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. There is a torrent, a river of evil that is the substitute, the counterfeit of the river of God. And I, I don't think you, you, uh, you, if you're just awake at all about what's happening in our world, there is this river of evil that's come out of the mouth of Satan prior to this event. This toxic filth that is filling the earth and polluting mankind even more. But it is in this passage to take the woman and sweep her away with the torrent. So we have these two. We live out amongst this other river. And so that's why this river becomes extremely important. We come out of the river there, not that we embrace it, not that we want to go swimming in it, not that we, we have to kind of walk ankle deep in it, however. But there is an alternate. But God has a plan. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring. Then it defines them. Those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And so we live in a world now where you, you have two rivers. One that flows from the throne into the earth and one that flows out of the serpent's mouth. So important to grasp the significance of the river of God's presence. So we go back, we go over a little further to Revelation 22. And the first three verses is, says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of the great city of the great street of the city. So all this is the same terminology you find in Ezekiel. I believe it's the same river. Ezekiel saw the river. Now John sees the river. And he says, it's a river that makes glad the city of God. It's flowing from the throne of God, out of the Lamb, in the middle of the great street of the city. And on each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. So this, there's one river that's eternal. And it's a river of blessing. It's a river that does away with the curse. It's a river that brings healing because it comes from the throne, throne of grace. And so this river has a progression. A progression. And... So when we come in and we begin to worship, we begin to get a sense that, that God's presence, we, we know theologically 
Biblically, we know God is here because he's Emmanuel, so he's always with us. And so he says, where the two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. And so we kind of have that up here. But when you come in here and you exercise your faith, you say, God, I believe you're here. I believe you're here right now. I believe you're here for this worship service because it's all about you. Everything's about you. I believe. As soon as you take that mode, and you begin to sense God's presence, he Hebrews chapter 11 says it starts with believing. He that comes, <clears throat> excuse me, he that comes to God. Everybody say, coming to God. And that's what we do when we, when we gather in corporate worship. We're coming to God. We're not coming from me. We're coming to God. We're not doing it just because it's religious. We're, we're coming to God. And so when you come in, you make that decision. It's a faith decision. It's in your heart. It's on the inside. He that comes to God must believe that he is. Another way of saying it is that he is there. You don't speak to people that you don't think are there. How many of you speak to people you don't think are there? Okay, I'm glad you didn't raise your hand. Or we get you up here for prayer. I want to make this so simple because... In the simplicity is the power. He that comes to God must believe that he is. So we start with this basic building block. You come in, you've had whatever kind of week, but you come in here and you say, Lord, I'm meeting with you today. I'm, I'm, I'm with the brothers and the sisters. And you said, you live here. You live here. Yeah, you, you actually live in Wheelstone. And you live where your people are. You live in them, and you live among them, and on them, and in them, and through them, and over them. And we connect with you, not just because we got it in our brain, but because we choose to believe. We choose to believe. Nobody can do it for you. You can sit in your seat. You can stand. You can do whatever you do. But inside, you know, if you're saying, Lord... The most important thing is meeting with you. It's meeting with you. I want to meet with you in every word that we sing and that we share. I want to meet with you. He that comes to God must believe that he is. That's kind of level one. He's here. And it was quite a number of years before I captured the other half of that. And that he is a rewarder. Everybody say rewarder. He's a rewarder. What's God telling us? He said, if you believe I'm here, then I'm here. And if I'm here, I'm not just here. I'm not just here. I come, and one of the ways I come is I come as a rewarder. But, but Pastor, I, I don't deserve a reward. I haven't been the best Christian. I haven't done my Bible so much. I, did, I didn't pray it like I should. I'm upset with my grandmother. You know, I, I didn't get a birthday card. Or, you know, whatever it is that's going on in your head. But when you believe, when you believe, he comes. And when he comes, he says, I want you to know I'm not just here. I'm not just getting close. I'm here as the rewarder. I'm here as a rewarder. I'm here as a rewarder. Right now in this room, as surely as you're sitting here with whatever you've got going on, the rewarder is here. He's here. He's here. It starts with that first step of faith where you come in and you say, Lord, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. Most people do whatever they do because they're programmed and taught and trained to do it. But this is a simple little process. I was in a meeting where a woman had a notion in her head that if she went to the church service, if she just went to the church service, that Jesus would be there in a way that she didn't find him in her devotional. 
course he's there in her devotional life, but she would find him in a way that was different than her own personal devotional life. And she went into that service. And God met her faith. His presence flooded her being. And as a result of it, she was healed completely, totally, and utterly of incurable fatal diseases. She believed, and she thus met the rewarder. She met the rewarder. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11 talks about God opening heaven. Genesis 7 and verse 11. In the 600 year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all of the springs of the great deep burst forth. Everybody say springs. And the floodgates of the heavens were opened. And rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. God sanctified the earth. But I want to show you the difference in terminology. Springs and floodgates. In terms of God's presence, which would you prefer, springs or floodgates? Floodgates. Or after the floodgates. The floodgates, God says there's some floodgates in heaven. Oh, but pastor, he's talking there about literal rain. That's true. He is. What were we singing about? What was the, the rain that Clive's exhortation was about. It, it's a reign of God's presence, his power, his character, his life, his goodness. Springs and floodgates. Psalm 42 and verse 7 says, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. There's something in us all whence you have been saved and baptized in the Spirit. There's something in you that, that has a hunger for God's presence and, and for something more, for something beyond. Even though all of us have had certain experiences with God, wonderful things, maybe some miracles, some healings, some breakthroughs, some jobs, some, some stuff that, that is a great testimony, but there's still something inside of you that says, there's more! There's more. I anticipate the day that every special needs child comes into the service and goes out no longer a special needs child. I anticipate the day when people who come in with all kinds of addictions and all kinds of stuff that the world defines as one way or another and they go out totally different. Why? Because a group of people said, okay, we're going after him, and we believe him. The rewarder comes. The rewarder comes. The rewarder comes. And so, in terms of progression, we have a sense, we know God's here. We say, we believe you. We're coming for you, Lord. And so we kind of move to the next level, maybe the, the ankle leap moves and gives way to the sense of God's presence. And you, you have a stronger sense that the current of God's presence, the consciousness of God's presence is stronger than when I first started. And there's that movement until the water becomes a river. And then ultimately it empties into this vast ocean of water the depths of God's presence. Let's have the next slide that says the holy place. He 
You see in this slide here, the priest is standing outside of the most holy place. He's standing at the altar of incense. And in the, in the Bible, incense is the symbol of prayer and worship. And it's going up continually. And that's where he is. And God says, I want you to understand the progression from the outer court right through from the, to the brazen altar and then the brazen laver. And then you come to the inside of this first little room here. On the right is the table of showbread. You were singing about that today. There is the golden candlestick, the light and the anointing oil. And there is this incense and the fragrance of praise. All this is part of a worship service. All that's part of a church service where God lives. But there is this last room that is the most significant place, and that's where the most awesome presence of God changed everything for the nation. And so there's that natural progression. And that there's that natural flow of the river. And here's the danger. The danger is to stop where that priest is. Because if, as you know, our high priest went through all of these and he appeared before the Father at the temple, the tabernacle in heaven, took his own blood, stuck it on the mercy seat, and said, I made everybody who believes in me acceptable. So now I'm going to cause the curtain between these two rooms to be ripped open so every person will not require a priest. They can come straight into the presence of God. Straight in. Straight in. The danger is, in a worship service, we can stay right where this priest is. We got something going up, and that's good. That's God-ordained. But there's something inside of us that says, hey, there's more just beyond where we've gone. I want you to say there's more. Say it again, there's more. Next slide. You see, this is where we're headed. This is this family before the throne of God Almighty. And when it happens experientially in our service, you will go out of here like the song we used to sing. You won't leave here like you came. In Jesus' name. Now, I've only just started to unpack this. And I want to give the steps from the scripture over the next few weeks. Because I believe that that's my assignment from the Lord is to go where I've never gone, to lead us all where none of us have ever gone. I'm not happy with just ankle. I'm not happy with just knee. I'm not satisfied with just waters to the waist. I want every single member of this house to be in divine health. You think God can do that? I want every single person in this house to have a really good job and to have no financial issues. You think the rewarder can do that? I want every backslidden family member to come back to Christ for every family in this house. You think the rewarder can do that? I believe he can. I believe that's his heart. And I believe, as I read the Bible, God says these two great streams come to their climax at the end of time. The mystery of iniquity gets so big, so awful, so terrible, 
the river of filth so covers the earth. But at the same time, there is a river of grace that's the door of hope for everybody who's been living in the wrong river. Stand to your feet if you would. I want the ministry team to come right now. Clive, can you play for us? How deep the Father's love for us. I think I've got it here if you need it. Here you go. Walking with the Lord is steps of progression. I'm so thankful, Joseph, that what I started with June 6, 1963, I didn't stick there. The God who loved me said, come on, Rick. Come on. I want to take you where you've never gone. And you know, he's never stopped telling me that. He's never said, you're, you're nearly 72, so you can coast the rest of the way. I'm done telling you anything that you need. No, his voice is the same every morning. He said, come on. Come. It's echoed in the book of Revelation, where the Bible says, and the spirit and the bride, both of them have the same message. The spirit and the bride say, come. We're going to sing this great declaration of how much God loves us. He loves me. He loves you. And if he loves you and you believe him, He's here today, Mary, as the rewarder. Whatever stuff is going on in your life, the one who loves you most is here to bring the reward that changes whatever needs to be changed. Is that okay? How deep the Father's love for how fast beyond all measure that he should give his only son to make this wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing love. The Father turns His face away As wounds which Mother chosen one Bring many sons to glory Behold the man of Upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. A shame I hear my mocking voice call out among the stars. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. 
I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ. In his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His words have paid my ransom. Why should I gain? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His words have paid my ransom. Bow your hearts with me right now. The one who stood in my place. The one who stood in your place is here right now. He's here right now. I'm so grateful today. My name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the one who wrote my name down in blood is here right now. The rewarder is here right now. As we stand in his presence, you're here in this meeting, you say, Pastor, I want to get closer to the rewarder than ever I've been in my whole life. Because if there's anything I need, it's the reward of God, the reward of heaven. And so I'm going to come today in faith that I'm connecting with the one who has promised to be my rewarder. He said to my spiritual father, Abraham, he said, I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. That's how much of a rewarder he is. You say, Pastor, I got some stuff I need to bring to the rewarder. I need an exchange of some earthly stuff, some stuff that's negative, that's, that's less than good or perfect or wonderful, that's a deficit or a, a sickness or, or an estrangement or, or a curse or whatever it is. I want to come to the rewarder for an exchange, and I'm coming in faith today to the rewarder. I want to get my family saved. I want to get stuff that belongs because of all the promises of God. I'm coming to the rewarder today. If that's you, then I want you to step out of your seat and come to those that are standing here as they represent the rewarder. They're going to distribute heaven's reward into your life. Is that you? Is there anything you want to bring to him today? Go ahead, get out of your seat and come, come say, Lord, I, you got what I need. You got what I need, Lord. You got what I need. Thank you, Lord. Why should I gain from this reward? 
I cannot give an answer. Of this I know with all my heart is blood that paid my ransom. Uh, why should? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart is worth a paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart is worth obeying my ransom. If you're seated in, if you're standing in the congregation, join hands with somebody. Join hands with somebody. Father, we thank you right now that you flow from member to member in this house. You said out of your innermost being would flow a river. And so, Lord, as we're joined 